if it's the change I think it is, then what you should have in your portfolio going forward can be very different from what it has been. I think it was the most important single event in the financial world in the last 50 years. That there is Howard Marks, famous billionaire and one of the most highly respected investors in the world. Over the years, he's built a personal net worth of over $2 billion. But beyond his incredible investing career, you might also know him from his investing memos, where he explains all the important events he sees unfolding in the market. Marx has been writing these memos since 1990. But if you've been following along with his thoughts over the past year or so, you'll know that he is currently seeing a major sea change occurring in the stock market, one that will have lasting implications. So, make sure to stick around to the end of the video because Marx provides details on how he recommends people invest to take advantage of a once in 50 year opportunity. Take a listen. Let's talk about two memos that you've written uh, not too long ago that are fairly well known. One was written last year called Sea Change. And in Sea Change, as I understand it, uh, and as I remember from reading the, the memo, you said in your lifetime in the investment world, there have been three sea changes. Two of them occurred earlier, you describe what they are, and now there's a third sea change, and that third sea change is basically that interest rates are not coming down anytime soon, and we have to live in a higher interest rate environment for quite some time. Is that fair? Uh, 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 it's about fair. What I would say is that since 19, remember in 1980, the Fed funds rate was 20, and I had a loan outstanding from a bank at 22 and a quarter. 40 years later, the Fed funds rate was zero, and I had a loan outstanding from a bank at two and a quarter. So the decline of interest rates by 20 percentage points over that period was a dominant factor in the financial world. I think it was the most important single event in the financial world in the last 50 years. It doesn't get the credit. Well, okay. Was that the first sea change in your investment no, this career? Is the, well, that was, no, that was really the second. But the third uh, follows on from that. In the, in the period 09 through 13, the Fed took the Fed funds rate to zero to fight the global financial crisis, left it there a long time, and didn't have any luck getting it back up into what you might think are normal ranges. So we had a low interest rate environment, which made life very easy for borrowers, asset owners. It was easy to run a business. The economy was, was, did well. We had the longest bull market in history, the longest economic recovery in history. Uh, we had very low incidence of default and bankruptcy. Uh, it was an easy world. And if, if you read articles about, for example, Silicon Valley Bank, they talk about the easy money environment. And the main point of sea change is we're no longer in an easy money environment. So you mean all the geniuses of private equity are not geniuses? We've been benefited from uh, low interest rates? You well, you know, uh, th there is a part in sea change where I talk about the fact that uh, a guy says, oh, we can buy this company and make 10% a year. And then he turns to his capital markets person and says, what will it cost to get the money? We can borrow at eight. Borrow at eight, invest at 10, great, we do it. You buy the company, but in the, in the stimulated environment of low interest rates, the company does better, you make more than 10. Your cost of money declines from eight to six to five, and you, it costs you less to borrow the money, and you say, boy, I'm a genius. The US stock market has had a really good run for almost 40 years. Look at this chart. The S&P 500 started at about 100 in 1980 and went up to nearly 4,800 in 2022. So if you put $1,000 in the stock market in 1980, it would have turned into a huge $48,000 by 2022 and even more if you reinvested the dividends, like a whopping $122,000. That's a lot. During this time, many great companies started and the average public company made more money. American businesses also grew as they went global. All of this made the stock market perform really well. But according to Howard Marks, the main reason the stock market did so well was because interest rates went down. Let's check out this chart of the federal fund's effective rate, which is like a thermometer for interest rates in the US economy. Back in the early 80s, interest rates were sky high, almost 20%. But from 1980 to 2010, interest rates kept dropping every decade until they couldn't go any lower. 
After the big financial crisis, the Fed dropped rates to 0% and they stayed that way for a long time. Lower interest rates for 40 years were like a strong wind pushing the stock market. Let me break it down for you. The price of anything you own, whether it's a stock, a bond, or a piece of property, is based on the money it will give you in the future. But we bring that future money back to today using an interest rate. It might sound a bit tricky, but it's actually simple. Here's a fun way to think about it. Imagine that I want to give you $11,000 as a thank you for being a part of our channel. Just remember to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already because our investor community is growing fast and we'd love to have you. Now, back to the $11,000. There's a catch though. You won't get it today, you'll get it exactly 10 years from now. We make it official with a contract. Let's call it Contract A. Contract A says you'll get $1,000 in 10 years. So, here's the question. Since you're not getting the money for 10 years, What's it worth to you right now? In other words, if someone wanted to buy contract A from you today, what would be a fair price? Think about this because it's what Howard Marks is talking about. Remember when I said the value of any asset depends on the money it will bring you? Brought back to today using an interest rate? That's the key. The value of contract A depends a lot on today's interest rates we have to discount that $1,000 back to today's dollars because money in the future isn't as valuable as money today. This idea is called the time value of money. Let's see how this works. Let's see what happens to contract A's value when we change the interest rate. When the interest rate is 20%, it's worth $162. But as we lower the rate to 15%, it goes up to $247. If we drop it to 10%, it shoots up to $386. Now, let's be really bold and go down to 7%. Now it's worth $58. And if we go super low to 2%, it skyrockets to a whopping $820. Notice how contract A's value started at $162 and climbed to $820 just because the interest rate went down. This is what Howard Marks was talking about when he said that falling interest rates have been a big help to stocks. Now, think about this. Contract A is like a stock. It's a piece of paper that says you'll get money in the future. Similarly, when you own a stock, you own a piece of a company and you have a legal right to a share of the money that company makes in the future. What happens to the stock market in the future depends a lot on what happens with interest rates. Here's what Howard Marks said about that. All right, so um, let me make sure I understand. Uh, your view is the interest rates have come up and are fairly high right now, um, but the conventional wisdom in Washington, which is not always right, in fact, it's wrong more than it's right, is that the Fed probably next year will begin to lower interest rates. And if the Fed does begin to lower interest rates because inflation's getting down to 2%, their target, you don't think interest rates will come down and we'll go back for another 20 years of low interest rates? Why do you think that we're going to keep interest rates relatively high? I think that what I said in the memo is that rates are likely to be between two and four, not between zero and two, the Fed funds rate. And, uh, you know, between zero and two is uh, an emergency measure. And, you know, rates were, uh, the Fed funds rate was zero much of the probably the majority of the time in the 09 to 21 period. And that's inappropriate. It's, it, 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 it stimulates. You, sh you can't live on a, a shot of adrenaline every morning for 13 years. And it, it does uh, uh, subsidize borrowers and penalize lenders and savers. Um, and I would like to see a Fed get to a neutral position, which is neither stimulative nor restrictive, and I, I and I, I describe that as two to four. If inflation's two, then the Fed funds rate should be higher than that, so that there's a positive real Fed funds rate. Earlier in this video, we talked about how higher interest rates are supposed to make stock prices go down. But as it often happens, real life can be more complicated than theory. In the past year and a half or so, interest rates have gone up faster than they have in a very long time. At the start of 2020, the federal funds rate was about 
and in less than two years, it's gone up to over 5%. With interest rates going up so much, you might expect stock prices to drop a lot, right? Well, that hasn't really happened. The US stock market is only down about 10% from its highest point. This is because many people think these higher interest rates won't last. They believe that as inflation goes down and the economy slows, the Federal Reserve will have to lower interest rates back to the really low levels we've seen in the past. That's why the stock market hasn't reacted very negatively to the big increase in interest rates. But Howard Marks has a different view. To get why, you need to understand something called real rates. In simple terms, real interest rates take into account the effect of inflation. Here's a quick way to figure it out. Imagine that the current interest rate is 5%. We call this the nominal interest rate, kind of like the interest rate before we think about inflation. And let's say inflation is 4%. To find the real interest rate, you subtract inflation from the nominal rate. So in this case, you'd get a real interest rate of 1%. Marx thinks that higher nominal interest rates are going to stick around. He argues that lenders, the folks who loan out money, need to get a positive real return to make lending worthwhile. Using our example, if the nominal interest rate dropped to 2% and inflation stayed at 4%, the real interest rate would be minus 2%. Marx believes this would be a bad situation because no sensible investor would lend money if they end up losing money after factoring in inflation. So, Marx thinks interest rates will need to stay higher in the next decade compared to the previous one. This is how he suggests investing when interest rates are higher. Let's talk about your other memo. You have another one called Further Thoughts on Sea Change. Yes. And that one, which, which was wrote, written a couple months ago, right. uh, the essence of it, if I can describe it, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, is that because of the sea change that you described in your earlier memo, you think that there's going to be a sea change in assets that people are going to want to own. Right. And they're going to want to own more fixed income assets because interest rates are going to be high for quite some time. Is that fair? That's fair. You know, the S&P has returned, S&P 500 stock index has returned 10% a year plus just a little over 10 for 100 years. That was enough to turn a dollar in 1920 into $15,000. That's, that's a good rate of return. Today, you can get equity type returns from what we call credit instruments, loans, uh, corporate, corporate loans, loans for buyouts. Uh, you can get high single digits on high yield bonds and leveraged loans public instruments that are tradable and liquid, or low double digits on, um, on private loans for buyouts, the best buyouts, the biggest buyouts, uh, double digit returns. Isn't that enough? And, and loans on credit instruments, I mean, returns on credit instruments are much safer than equity. Equity just gets the residual. After everybody gets paid, they get what's left. Credit gets paid early in the process, and if people don't pay you, you get the company because they go bankrupt. So it's quite safe, and, uh, and uh, returns that are fully competitive with equities with a good uh, level of safety. Between 2001 and 2021, if you wanted to make good money with your investments, you pretty much had to put your money in stocks. Other options, like savings accounts and bonds, didn't offer much in terms of returns. But now, with higher interest rates becoming more common, Howard Marks thinks people will start moving their money from stocks to safer stuff called credit instruments. Let me break it down. Marks went to the University of Chicago and learned about something called the risk curve. Basically, it's like a chart that says, if you want to make more money from your investments, you have to be okay with more risk. In simple terms, if all investments made the same amount of money, why would anyone put their money in a roller coaster stock market when they could just leave it in a safe savings account? So, people invest in risky stuff because they hope to make more money. Now, check this out. When interest rates are low, like they've been, investors might have to take big risks, like buying super volatile stocks, to get the returns they want. But when interest rates go up, the risk curve moves up too. So, 
If you want the same return, like 10%, you don't have to take as much risk. You could put your money in high-quality bonds instead of stocks. Bonds are less risky because if a company goes bankrupt, bondholders get their money back before stockholders do. If higher interest rates stick around, it could change how lots of people and organizations invest. The days when everyone felt like they had to put their money in the stock market might be over. We'll have to wait and see if Marx's prediction comes true. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more weekly investment tips. Leave a comment below. Happy investing!